Okay. Um, so let's continue our discussion about spectral theory um, for self-adjoint compact operators. So let me just briefly recall um, the spectrum of a bounded operator, which was supposed to be a generalization of the eigenvalues of a matrix. So we defined the resolvent set of A to be those complex numbers such that A minus lambda times the identity, which I just write as A minus lambda, is an invertible uh, bounded linear operator, meaning it is um, bijective and which by the open mapping theorem tells you that the inverse is also continuous. Um, and the spectrum of A is simply those lambda so that A minus lambda is not invertible. So the complement of resolvent set of A, okay? And so, you know, from linear algebra, you have the following uh, characterization of what the spectrum is, that uh, if H is Cn and A is just therefore a matrix on Cn or Rn, if you like, then the spectrum is just simply the set of eigenvalues of A, okay? And if we restrict our attention to um, Hermitian matrices, uh, meaning the, which are referred to as, uh, which are also um, referred to as self-adjoint also in, in linear algebra or symmetric if we're just looking at um, real vector spaces are in, um, then the eigenvalues are real and you can find an orthonormal basis of the space Cn or Rn depending on which you're looking at uh, for this symmetric matrix so that uh, it complete in that matrix, the matrix, in that basis, the matrix is completely diagonalized, okay? And what are the diagonal elements? They're the eigenvalues of the matrix, okay? And what we're going to end up proving is that that picture, this kind of picture where the, um, for a, you know, self-adjoint matrix on CN, that the spectrum is given by the eigenvalues uh, and uh, you can diagonalize, essentially diagonalize uh, this operator, meaning you can form find an orthonormal basis consisting entirely of eigenvectors of the operator is also true for uh, self-adjoint compact operators, okay? This shouldn't come too much of a surprise, as too much of a surprise since compact operators are uh, limits of finite rank, i.e. matrix matrices uh, um, in the space of bounded linear operators, okay? So that's where we're headed. Um, now, so just to follow up on this uh, and for a little bit of review, so, you know, in the finite dimensional space, in the finite dimensional case, the spectrum can be, um, or the spectrum is always just the eigenvalues of the matrix A, uh, not so in the infinite dimensional setting. For example, if we're looking at little l2 and then A times A is equal to uh, let's say A1 over 1, A2 over 2, and so on for A, the sequence in L2, then um, what you can prove is that 0 is in the spectrum of A, all right? One way to see that is that uh, each of the, if you like, basis vectors uh, of H given where you just have one in the nth slot and zero otherwise. Each of those is a, an eigenvector of this operator A with eigenvalue one over n, where the n tells you where the one is and zero otherwise. So one over n is, in, uh, is an eigenvalue of this operator for each n, and one over n converges to zero, and since the spectrum of a bounded linear operator is a compact set, in particular closed, zero, which is the limit of that sequence, has to also be in the spectrum, okay? And in fact, what we're going to show is that 
you know, kind of in the non-degenerate case, what we see here is what in general happens for compact self-adjoint operators, that um, if it's not a finite rank operator, then it has countably many, uh, or countably infinite many, that's not a very good string of words, countably infinite eigenvalues which converge to zero, okay? And zero may be an eigenvalue, may not be, okay? And um, what's more, that's going to be the only, uh, that completely characterizes the spectrum. So let me just write here for this example that, in fact, the spectrum of A is equal to the point zero union 1 over n in a natural number. And these are, again, for this operator here, these are the eigenvalues. And this is just, well, 0 is 0. But 0 is not an eigenvalue, OK? Now, this is not the general picture, meaning uh, that for a compact self-adjoint operator, you'll have uh, infinitely many eigenvalues. And then 0 will not be an eigenvalue. You, you could have 0 an eigenvalue as well. But uh, in general, what the picture is is that anything in the spectrum that's not 0 has to be an eigenvalue. Okay, and that's essentially what we'll prove uh, uh, our first result of uh, this lecture is that uh, is the following. So this is the Fredholm alternative. So let. A be a self-adjoint compact operator and uh, lambda be a non-zero real number. Then the range of a minus lambda is closed. So this is the conclusion. And thus, the range of a minus lambda is equal to the orthogonal complement of the orthogonal complement of itself. which um, the orthogonal complement of the range of a minus lambda is equal to the null space of the adjoint. And since a is self-adjoint and lambda is a real number, the adjoint is just a minus lambda. OK? So this right here is the main conclusion from which you get this. And therefore, just to spell out uh, the conclusion of this equality, therefore, either uh, one of two alternatives happens. So that's the name alternative. Either um, a minus lambda is bijective, or the null space of a minus lambda, which is just uh, the eigenspace of, of a minus lambda, or I should say the eigenspace corresponding to uh, lambda is non-trivial. And finite dimensional. Moreover, this equality here tells you when you can solve the equation a minus lambda u equals f, right? Uh, you can solve a minus lambda u equals f if and only if f is in the range of a minus lambda, which is if and only if f is orthogonal to the null space of a minus lambda. So let me make a little uh, 
remark here. So first off, um, the fact that this space has to be finite dimensional, we proved last time, right? We proved at the end of uh, um, lecture, the last lecture, that for a compact self-adjoint operator, the null space, the eigenspace corresponding to a given non-zero eigenvalue uh, is finite dimensional, right? And then we also proved the eigenspaces corresponding to two different eigenvalues uh, or orthogonal, and we also proved that the eigenvalues that are non-zero or any eigenvalue has to be real, okay? So now let me make a, a couple of remarks. The first is just a, a rephrasing of uh, what's in the theorem. And therefore, um, F is in the range of a minus lambda, meaning you can solve the equation a minus lambda u equals f if and only if f is in the null space of your, the ortho orthogonal complement of a minus, uh, of the null space of a minus lambda, okay? So what this says is that uh, you can solve for f given that f satisfies finitely many uh, linear conditions, okay? Right, because the null space of a minus lambda is finite dimensional, so f being orthogonal to that means pick a finite base, uh, a finite ortho orthonormal basis of a minus null space of a minus lambda. Then f inner product with those finitely many vectors has to be zero. So you have finitely many conditions on f to be able to solve for f. And not only that, this solution that you compute is also unique up to finitely many conditions because, again, the null space of a minus lambda is um, or unique up to a finite dimensional subspace, again, because the null space of a minus lambda is finite dimensional. And the second is uh, that uh, since uh, for a self-adjoint uh, operator we have that the spectrum is a subset of the real numbers, right, for a self-adjoint operator. This is something we proved uh, last lecture. It doesn't have to be compact, just the self-adjoint operator. So since the spectrum is a subset of the reals, this proves that for a compact self-adjoint operator, the spectrum of A is equal to the set of eigenvalues of A, or I should say non-zero eigenvalues of A. Or let's, let's, let's write it this way. If I look at what's in the spe spectrum other than zero, possibly, uh, then the non-zero numbers that are in the spectrum have to be eigenvalues. Okay? So for a compact self-adjoint operator, and of just in the case of uh, matrices, the spectrum, the non-zero spectrum, has to be, uh, are nothing but eigenvalues, okay? And last time, remember, we proved that the eigenvalues are countably infinite uh, or, or countable. They're either finite or countably infinite. And if they're countably infinite, they converge to zero, okay? Again, by last lecture, we conclude, again, that uh, the spectrum of A, take away zero, equals either uh, finitely many uh, eigenvalues or countably infinite eigenvalues with that are converging to zero, okay? So from the Fredholm alternative, you know, we get a lot of information about when we can solve equations, but it also tells us, I mean, from that uh, ability to say when we can solve equations, we can also um, characterize the non-zero spectrum of a, a self-adjoint compact operator. Okay, so we need to prove that, so remember all of this just followed from, you know, stuff we had proven 
and the main, the main conclusion of the theorem, which is that the range of A minus lambda is closed. So we need to prove that the range of A minus lambda is closed when lambda is a non-zero real number. So um, suppose that you have a sequence in the range, which I'll write as A minus lambda times un converging to some uh, element f in H. Okay, so what we'd like to be able to show is that f is in the range. So uh, we want to show f is in the range of H, or not range of H, range of A. Uh, minus lambda, sorry. Hope I didn't make that mistake elsewhere. No, just okay. Now we're only assuming that a minus lambda, uh, when it hits u sub n, converges to f. We're not a priori assuming the u sub n's converge. Okay. In fact, we can't. Um, now, but in the end, we will like to come up with you know, maybe a subsequence or, or a part of the use of ends up to a subsequence which does converge, and then we conclude that f is in the range, all right? So um, first, I want to get rid of kind of the useless part of the use of ends. So uh, let w be, uh, well, I don't need to give it a name, really. Where is my eraser? So let Vn be the projection onto the orthogonal complement of the null space of A minus lambda of U sub n. Okay? Um, so now this is just part of. So every u sub n is written, is, you can write as um, something in the null space of a minus lambda since, uh, so since null space of a minus lambda is a closed subspace of H, it has uh, an orthogonal complement so that it's, it and its orthogonal complement gives a direct uh, product, uh, or when you take their direct product, gives you H, right? So. Um, why am I saying that? Because then, if I take a minus lambda u sub n, this is equal to a minus lambda applied to pi, so the projection onto the null space of u sub n plus the projection onto the orthogonal complement of the null space, which I defined as v sub n. Now, this element here is in the null space of a minus lambda, so when a minus lambda hits it, I get zero, so I get a minus lambda applied to v sub n, all right? Then a minus lambda v sub n equals a minus lambda u sub n, which converges to f, all right? So basically, I've taken away uh, some noise, all right, all right? Uh, the part that when it hits a minus lambda, I get zero. So now I just have these v sub n's, uh, which lie in uh, in the orthogonal complement of the null space of a minus lambda. Okay. So uh, my claim is. Uh, First is that the sequence v sub n is bounded. Right? Basically, once I can show this, then I'm kind of done. Because if I can show v sub n is bounded, then since a is a compact operator, when a hits v sub n up to a subsequence, that converges. Okay? Now this whole expression converges, and therefore lambda times v sub n converges. Lambda is non-zero, so then v sub n converges up to a subsequence to something. And therefore, a minus lambda v sub n converges to a minus lambda of v for some v, uh, which shows that f is in the range of a minus lambda. So this is really the whole ballgame. Um, 
and we'll use here kind of crucially as well that we threw away useless parts of u sub n, useless at least to this uh, argument. Um, okay, so I claim uh, this is bounded, so suppose not. Then there exists subsequence, call it B sub n sub j, such that uh, um, B sub n sub j goes to uh, infinity, okay, as j goes to infinity. All right. Now, if I look at A minus lambda applied to V sub n sub j over norm of V sub n sub j, this uh, converges. So first off, um, since A is a linear operator, this is equal to 1 over norm V n sub j times A minus lambda applied to V sub n sub j. And so this scalar, 1 over norm V, uh, n sub j converges to 0. This converges to f, so I get the 0 vector in h. Okay, so um, this thing converges to 0 uh, in the Hilbert space h. Now, why is that bad? Because um, essentially what this is going to say is that there exists some element uh, or that this sequence converges at least up to a subsequence to an element v with norm 1 because they all have norm 1 so that a minus lambda v equals 0. But all of these are in the null space of a minus lambda and we get a contradiction. So, um, right, so we have that a minus lambda, okay, so we have that part. Since A is a compact operator, uh, there exists a subsequence, so a further subsequence. I'm just going to call it N sub K instead of N sub J sub K. Uh, B sub N sub K of B sub N sub J such that the sequence A sub B sub N sub K converges, okay? But then I get that B sub N sub K, or I should say, uh, B sub N sub K over norm of B sub N sub K. Okay, so these all have norm one, and A applied to something that has unit length, uh, or, or the image of by A of the closed unit ball is a precompact, or, or the closure of it is compact, and therefore every sequence has a convergent subsequence. Um, then V sub n sub k over the norm of V sub n sub k. This is equal to one over lambda times um, A applied to V sub N sub K over norm of V sub N sub K minus A minus lambda applied to V sub N sub K. Okay? Now, this sequence of elements converges to zero. That's, in fact, what we just proved. Uh, and this converges... Uh, by how we've taken this subsequence because A is a compact operator. So I have this sequence of vectors is equal to, uh, and here we can divide by lambda because lambda is non-zero. Uh, it's equal to, you know, a linear combination of two sequences which converge, um, and therefore we get that V sub N sub K over norm of V sub N sub K K. converges to uh, an element V. And 
Now, the null space or the orthogonal complement of the null space of a minus lambda, each of these is in, remember, the, null, the orthogonal complement of the null space. And since it's converging to an element and this is closed, this element has to be in the same set. So again, this follows from uh, the fact that V is in here is because this set is closed. All right? The orthogonal complement of any uh, subset of a Hilbert space is closed. All right. Then by continuity of the norm, basically, the norm of V has to be equal to limit as k goes to infinity of the norm of the elements converging to it, which all equal 1, OK? And if I compute a minus lambda applied to v, this is equal to, since the v sub n sub k's over norm v sub n sub k's are converging to v, a minus lambda applied to v sub n sub k over norm v sub n sub k. And remember, this is a subsequence of v sub n sub j's. And when a minus lambda hits that, they're converging to 0. So all, right. all of that predicated upon the assumption that the norm of v sub n sub k's converges to uh, infinity, or that Right, that the sequence is unbounded. Okay, so we have this element uh, in the null space that has, uh, or the orthogonal complement of the null space that has norm one, but also gives you zero, and therefore we get that v is in the null space of a minus lambda from this computation, and uh, its orthogonal complement. Okay, But the only possible uh, vector that's in a space and its orthogonal complement is the zero vector, uh, or the um, only vector in a subspace and its orthogonal complement is the zero vector. And therefore, V equals 0, which this is a contradiction to the fact that the norm of V equals 1. OK? So uh, we started off with the sequence V sub n's, assuming that they are unbounded. V sub n over norm V sub n uh, is a uh, sequence of essentially, um, so maybe you got lost in the subsequences, but Let's just assume I'm talking about the entire sequence. Then, the, then v sub n over norm v sub n, uh, when a minus lambda hits it, converges to zero. Since a is a compact operator, we can choose a sub. We can show essentially that a applied to v sub n over norm v sub n because those things have unit length converges to something. And since lambda is non-zero, we can then conclude that uh, those vectors converge. Uh, in fact, to something, not just their images by a or their images by a minus lambda, again, because lambda is non-zero, all right? And since they all have unit length, their limit must have unit length. And since when a minus lambda hits these guys, they go to zero, the limit must also, uh, when a minus lambda hit it, equal zero. And that gives us our contradiction because this limit v had to be in the, null, the orthogonal complement of the null space but then also in the null space and have unit length, uh, those three things can all happen at once. Okay. So uh, thus, the sequence v sub n is bounded. Okay. So remember, how was the v? What were the v sub n's uh, to start with? They were so that a minus lambda v sub n's converged to this element f. And we wanted to show that f 
is in the range, right? So we come back over here. We have these V sub n so that a minus lambda V sub n converges to f, and we want to show f is in the range to conclude that the range of a minus lambda is closed. But now that since it's bounded, and we've kind of done this argument already, uh, this is essentially the whole ball game. Since the sequence V sub n is bounded, and a is a compact operator, we conclude that um, there exists a subsequence V sub n sub j, such that, so this has nothing to do with the previous argument now, but I just don't feel like using different letters, uh, such that A applied to V sub n sub j converges. So remember, A is a compact operator, which, you know, we stated in an, it, it in terms of the closure of the image of the closed unit ball being compact. Equivalently, by scaling the unit ball, it means that A takes any bounded sequence to uh, a sequence that has a convergent subsequence, okay? So we showed B sub n is bounded, and therefore, since A is a compact operator, we can find a subsequence so that when A hits it, we have a convergent sequence, okay? And by that same trick we used a minute ago, we conclude that V sub n sub j, which is, and we can do this because lambda is non-zero, we can divide by it, um, a v sub n sub j minus a minus lambda v sub n sub j. Now, again, this here is converging to something. This here is converging to f, right? So uh, this linear combination of convergent sequences is convergent. Converges to... Uh, an element V, and therefore I get that F, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of the V sub n's, but um, convergence still holds if I look at a subsequence, A minus lambda V sub n sub J equals, and since A minus lambda, so A is a bounded linear operator, lambda times the identity is a bounded linear operator, this is equal to A minus lambda V, and therefore F is in the range of A minus lambda, okay? So uh, Fred Holm alternative tells you that the range of A minus lambda for a compact self-adjoint operator is closed. Um, so, you know, where did we really use the fact that it was self-adjoint? Nowhere in this argument. So this uh, fact that the range of A minus lambda is closed is still true if, um, you know, A is just a compact operator and lambda is just some non-zero uh, complex number. Um, but where we use that it's self-adjoint is kind of, I guess, in, in the rest of the conclusion that the range of A minus lambda is therefore equal to the null space of A minus lambda, and therefore either A minus lambda is bijective or the null space of A minus lambda is non-trivial and finite dimensional by what we did in the previous lecture. Okay. Now, again, this is a, a very powerful theorem. And again, what this says is that if I look at the non-zero spectrum of a compact self-adjoint operator, then that consists entirely of eigenvalues of A, right? Now, earlier we proved that plus or minus the norm of A has to be in the spectrum, right, of a self-adjoint operator. And therefore, what we can conclude is that if we have a non-trivial self-adjoint compact operator, then it has uh, 
at least one eigenvalue. And we can characterize that eigenvalue. So this, uh, we have the following theorem. Let A be a non-trivial uh, compact self-adjoint operator, A equals A star. Then as a non-trivial uh, eigenvalue lambda 1, and we can characterize lambda 1, or at least the absolute value of lambda 1, as the supremum over norm u equals 1, a u, u. Okay? Uh, equals, and this uh, supremum is actually achieved where u1 is uh, a normalized eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1. Okay. All right, so um, why do we have, or I should say, let me make sure I have everything here. Okay, so why is this? So first off, we've shown that uh, plus or minus the norm of A uh, is, in fact, in the spectrum of A. All right? For any self-adjoint uh, bounded linear operator, not necessarily compact, uh, that plus or minus, not necessarily both of them, but plus or minus one of these, at least one of plus or minus uh, since A is self-adjoint, meaning A star equals A. Uh, then lambda one, then I'm going to say plus or minus, meaning not both, actually at least one of these uh, is an eigenvalue of A by the Fredholm alternative. The Fredholm alternative and fact that so lambda 1 is going to be you know either uh, plus norm of a or minus norm of a uh, depending on whether which one is in uh, the spectrum let's say plus uh, if it's in the spectrum minus if plus is not uh, and the fact that uh, we can identify it as this quantity here is because we have that for self-adjoint operators, the norm of A, which is the absolute value of one of those plus or minuses that are in the spectrum is equal to, so this is where, so this is equal to um, soup u equals 1, au equals u. All right. So that's the uh, end of the proof. And now what we're going to do is we are going to keep going. All right. Um, so the end result will be that we can 
determine all of the eigenvalues via a certain maximum principle and build up um, a sequence of eigenvectors, normalized eigenvectors, which are pairwise uh, orthogonal simply because they come from um, how they're built up, uh, we'll see. And what? And then we'll show that uh, essentially that set of eigenvectors that we get along with uh, a set of uh, or an orthonormal basis chosen for the null space of A uh, form an orthonormal basis for uh, a separable Hilbert space H. Okay? So that's where we're going, but uh, we can basically take this theorem and keep applying it. So uh, we have the following maximum principle. If you like, this is the first step in a maximum principle. This says if you want to find the largest eigenvalue, lambda 1, um, I should say, I can even say largest eigenvalue largest in the sense of uh, um, absolute value. Why? Because remember the spectrum is contained in uh, the interval uh, minus norm A plus norm of A. Okay, So anything in the spectrum has to have uh, absolute value um, less than or equal to uh, the norm of A. And if it's an eigenvalue, it's, or if it's a Right, anything other than zero has to be an eigenvalue, so we get, uh, get this. Okay, so what's this maximum principle? Um, and why was I saying all that? Oh, so this gives you a way to, to if you'd like, try and find, or at least approximate, the first um, eigenvalue of a bounded linear operator, right? This is a maximization problem with uh, a constraint. Yeah, so you could use the method of Lagrange multipliers, um, you know, that doesn't maybe make sense to you to be able to do on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, but let's say you choose a big basis uh, of your Hilbert space and you just restrict to looking at that uh, big but finite dimensional or, or finite basis uh, or span of that finite basis and try to solve the approximate problem, then you should get close to um, the eigenvalue. Okay, and get an approximate eigenvector. Because as I've said, the eigenvector will be um, achieved, or I should say the, the eigenvector achieves this maximum here, or this supremum. Okay, so uh, the maximum principle is the following. So let A, again, we're only looking at compact self-adjoint operators. operator then the non-zero eigenvalues of A can be ordered. Now this we kind of this part we already know they can be ordered lambda one less than or equal to lambda two less than or equal to lambda three counted with multiplicity, meaning uh, if lambda 1 has a two-dimensional eigenspace, then lambda 2, or the absolute value of, or lambda 2 will be lambda 1. So we're, we'll repeat it according to multiple, multiplicity. Um, so we know that there's finitely many distinct eigenvalues. That was the part that I was saying. We know we can order them, but uh, you know, maybe it's it's uh, not clear that you can order them with multiplicity. Um, with corresponding. orthonormal eigenfunctions UK. So 
U1 is a normalized eigenfunction uh, for lambda 1. U2 will be a normalized eigenfunction for lambda 2, which is orthogonal to U1. So these are pairwise orthonormal. And how do we obtain uh, the eigenvalues in this order and these eigenfunctions via the following process so that lambda j is equal to the supremum over all uh, unit vectors that or are orthogonal to the first uh, j minus 1 to, uh, this will be achieved on the uh, use of J. Okay? So, um, we have the first one, if you like. We built up lambda 1, U1, and now what this maximum principle theorem is saying is that we can kind of repeat this, okay? Is that if we now look at um, this quantity here, the supremum over all norm 1, uh, vectors that are orthogonal to U1, then we're going to pick up uh, the next largest eigenvalue counted with multiplicity, meaning uh, it'll be the absolute value of lambda 2, which will be less than lambda 1 if you know, lambda 1 is, uh, only has a one-dimensional eigenspace, um, or it'll be lambda or a the ab absolute value of lambda 2 will be lam the absolute value of lambda 1 again if lambda 1 has a, let's say, two-dimensional eigenspace, okay? And if it had a three-dimensional eigenspace, we would get the absolute value of lambda 1 uh, for um, it would equal this number and this number as well, okay? So again, these, these um, non-zero eigenvalues are, uh, can be ordered in this way um, oh, and I left off one. And the lambda j is going to zero. Okay? Okay. So, we have the first one. Uh, the absolute value of lambda 1 and the first eigenvector u1, and now we're just going to basically repeat or apply the previous theorem to a modification of A. Now, um, I should say, this is not entirely true because there may only be finitely many. So really, this should be a, a remark. If um, the decreasing sequence does not terminate, then uh, the absolute value of the lambda j's goes to zero. Okay? Um, now, okay, so what's, what's kind of the new bit uh, of information here? You know, we do know that we can um, you know, for each, let's say, capital N, the number of eigenvalues outside of uh, or with absolute value bigger than 1 over N um, has to be finite. So, uh, you know, the fact that we can order them is not really that much new information. And the fact that they have to go to zero if this sequence is infinite, that's also not new information. I mean, we did prove that uh, in, in a previous lecture that if you have... Um, 
so there we proved it for a sequence of distinct eigenvalues, but because we now know that each of these has a finite dimensional uh, eigenspace, you know, if you just look back at the same proof uh, or, or that proof, you can make a small adjustment to be able to say um, that if you count the eigenvalues with multiplicity, then also the sequence has to go to zero, okay? Not just necessarily the sequence consisting of the distinct eigenvalues, okay? So let me make that small uh, um, remark. What the new piece is is that we can compute the eigenvalues in this way and choose the eigenvectors in this way, okay? That's the new piece and that's kind of what in the end we'll, we'll use to be able to show that uh, H can be, uh, or that A can basically be diagonalized, or that you can find uh, an orthonormal basis of a Hilbert space, separable Hilbert space, consisting entirely of eigenvectors of A. Okay? All right, so. The construction proceeds inductively. So, you know, at one point I said, you know, if you can do it for one, then you can do it for the next, and then I won't be so formal every time I do kind of an inductive uh, construction, and, but in this case, uh, it pays to be careful. So, um, you know, we'll construct the um, sequence of uh, lambda j's and u, and u k's in, in this way, all right, um, uh, via an inductive argument. Okay, so uh, coming up with k equals 1, that was the previous theorem, right? So previous, or I should say uh, j equals 1, that's the previous theorem, right? We defined, uh, we found the largest eigenvalue, or the eigenvalue with the, um, an eigenvalue with the largest absolute value via uh, this theorem, okay? And then we obtained an eigenvector this way, just basically as a consequence of the Fredholm alternative. And then that we know that plus or minus the norm of A has to be in the spectrum. Okay, so the fact that we can find the first eigenvalue lambda 1, that follows from the previous theorem. So now we want to do the inductive step. i.e., we want to suppose we have found lambda 1 up to lambda, let's say, what did I use here? Lambda n, so j equals n, along with uh, the normal uh, eigen vectors u1 up to un satisfying um, this uh, maximum principle okay so for j up to from j starting from starting at 1 up to n we've constructed or, or found the lambda 2 lambda 3 up to lambda n and the u1 up to u n satisfying that maximum uh, property. Okay. All right, so um, then there's two cases. Uh, so case one is the fact that A minus A is equal to uh, the sum from k equals 1 to n of lambda k u inner product u k u k. And therefore, um, what this shows is that we found all the eigenvalues, and the process terminates. Okay? 
So this is kind of the degenerate case that A is a uh, finite rank operator. Okay, so I could have started this whole theorem off with, let's assume A is not uh, a finite rank operator, and therefore we wouldn't have to deal with this case. But uh, I just stated it for an arbitrary A. So there is the possibility that that sequence stopped. Okay, we found all of the eigenvalues uh, with multiplicity in this in this process, and then the theorem or construction is done in that case. And the case two is that it is not a finite rank operator, so it's not equal to k equals 1 to n. Okay, now we have to show how can we find uh, lambda sub n plus 1, okay, and the eigenvector u sub n plus 1. Let a sub n be the operator a minus k equals 1 to n, lambda k inner product u. So I should say a u minus u sub k. All right? Now note, since we are in case 2, this operator is non-zero. Okay, so we're basically going to apply the previous theorem now to this operator. Okay, but let me first make a few remarks. Then A is, A sub n is a, and this is something you can check, it's a self, it's self adjoint compact operator. So why is it self adjoint? Basically because A is self adjoint uh, and these lambda k's are real numbers. Okay? Because the eigenvalues have to be real because A is self-adjoint. Um, and these are orthonormal. Um, so that is why they're self-adjoint. Why is it a compact operator? Well, it's the sum of a compact operator A and a finite rank operator here. So it's also a compact operator. Uh, and it's a non-trivial one because it's not identically equal to 0. So I shouldn't say uh, not equal to 0, but... Uh, which is not identically the zero operator. Okay. All right, so here's a couple of facts uh, that if u is in the span of u1 up to un, then I get that a sub n applied to u is the zero vector. Why is that? So it suffices to check that um, this gives me, this formula gives me zero when u is one of the uk's. Now if u is one of the uk's, then this will be um, one only when, or let's say it's one of the uj's, I need a different letter. So if u is one of these uj's, then this will give me one only when j equals k, and I pick up lambda j times uj, and then I have a hitting u sub j, and that spits out lambda j times u sub j because u sub j is an eigenvector of a. So then I get the same thing here and there, and subtracting them gives me zero. Um, now, if u is orthogonal to uh, the span of the u1 up to un, then I get a n of u equals a u, okay? So you just see this, if u is orthogonal to these, then this whole term is zero. Okay, and I just pick up a n u equals a u. Um, for all u in h, v in the span of u1 up to un, uh, if I compute a n u inner product v, this is equal to uh, u a n v since a n is self adjoint, and since v is in the span of the u ones up to u n's, by the first property that's going to be zero. So this equals zero, and therefore, um, what have I shown? 
I've shown that A in U, inner product V, is zero no matter what uh, U is in H, and therefore that means that V has to be in the uh, orthogonal complement of the range. Okay, so I said that backwards. So anyways, um, here U is fixed, V is a thing that's changing. So what does this say? U is fixed, A and U inner product V, when V is in the span, has to be zero. This holds for all V in the span, and therefore A and U has to be in the orthogonal complement of the span of these guys. So this proves that the range of A in is a subset of the orthogonal complement of U1 up to UN. And, okay, so from this previous property, we get one last property that if uh, a n u equals lambda u is non-zero, meaning we have a non-zero eigenvalue of a sub n, uh, then that implies that u so uh, u is equal to 1 over lambda a sub n applied to u. In other words, u is equal to a sub n applied to u over lambda. So that implies u is in the range of a sub n, um, which, again, is contained in the orthogonal complement of u1 up to u sub n. And since it's in the orthogonal complement, that means a sub n u equals a u. So any non-zero eigenvalue of A sub n has to be a non-zero eigenvalue of A. Okay. Now we just apply the previous theorem. To, um, to A sub n to get the next eigen or next uh, eigenvalue a sub n plus, or lambda sub n plus 1, and eigenvector u sub n plus 1. By the previous theorem. a sub n has a non-zero eigenvalue, which I will call lambda n plus 1, with unit eigenvector u sub n plus 1, so that lambda n plus 1 is equal to the soup over all uh, norm, so, ah, okay, soup over all norm, uh, or unit length vectors of absolute value of a sub n applied to u in a product u. Now, this soup is over all, is the same, uh, soup over all one so that a sub n u is non-zero, so that uh, in particular includes um, So if u is in the span of u1 up to un, then a n u equals 0. So the supremum over all unit length is the same as u, uh, the supremum over everything in the orthogonal complement of these guys, because these guys, when you stick them into a, n gives me uh, 0. So 
at the same supremum, but now also when u is in the orthogonal complement of these u1s up to un, this is equal to uh, soup of u on the orthogonal complement of the u1 up to uns, a n u, remember, equals a u. So that uh, gives us, you know, the fact that I can find this from this uh, supremum. And so why, okay, so why does this eigenvector have to be in the orthogonal complement of uh, u1 up to un? It's because I can choose it that way because, again, when a sub n hits any of anything in here, uh, I get 0, okay? So I should say this is also equal to a n applied to u n plus 1, but it's, uh, that's the same as a applied to u n plus 1, u n plus 1. Um, Right, okay, and this is less than or equal to the soup over norm u equals 1, u in span u1 up to u in minus 1, orthogonal complement a u applied to u, which equals uh, the absolute value of the nth eigenvalue counted with multiple multiplicity. Okay, so we found... Uh, the next eigenvalue um, in this sequence, um, again, of eigenvalues counted with multiplicity. Okay, so now we have, uh, we can conclude the following spectral theorem. For compact self adjoint operators, uh, let A be a um, self adjoint compact operator. space H let lambda 1 bigger than or equal to lambda 2 be corresponding um, eigenvalues be the eigenvalues, or I should say non-zero eigenvalues of A counted again with multiplicity. So uh, counted with multiplicity as we've constructed in this uh, theorem of, which I call the maximum principle. Uh, with corresponding um, orthonormal eigenvectors UK. So we have these eigenvectors um, coming from this process. And the conclusion is uh, this uh, um, subset of eigenvectors or orthonormal eigenvectors is uh, an 
orthonormal basis for the closure uh, or for the range of A. In fact, we can upgrade that. UK is, in fact, an orthonormal basis for the range of A closure. And there exists an orthonormal basis, call it uh, F sub J, of the null space of A, if it's non-zero, uh, such that U K K F J. Uh, so first off, the union of these two uh, sets of orthonormal vectors is then going to be a, again a subset of orthonormal vectors because all the fj's would correspond to the eigenvalue um, 0. And these uk's would correspond to eigenvalues that are non-zero. And by what we proved last time, uh, any eigenvector for two distinct eigenvalues would have to be orthonormal. So this subset is orthonormal from this subset. But moreover, is orthonormal, like I said, but also an orthonormal basis for H, OK? So in other words, I can find uh, an orthonormal basis for H consisting entirely of eigenvectors of this uh, self-adjoint compact operator, OK? So I will have one piece of this basis coming from the null space and the other piece uh, corresponding to um, non-zero eigenvalues. So really, uh, two follows from one. Um, not sure why I decided to state them separately, but here we are. So proof of one will show that UK is an orthonormal basis for the range of A. Um, so first off, note, as we did in the previous proof, that the process of obtaining the lambda 1 or the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, orthonormal eigenvectors, uh, terminates if and only if um, A was finite rank. In other words, there exists an N so that AU is this finite rank operator U in a product UK, UK. In this case, if it's a finite rank operator, then the range is contained in UK. The is which is what we wanted to prove for this case, that A is this finite rank operator. So suppose otherwise. In other words, the process does not terminate. So that we have countably infinite many uh, non-zero eigenvalues counted with multiplicity and, uh, and corresponding orthonormal eigenvectors u sub k. All right? So this is a more interesting. So 
or the eigenvalues are countably infinite. Okay, so now we want to show, so as in the remark that I made afterwards, we know that these lambda k's have to go to zero. Okay? Now, we want to prove that uh, the UK's are an orthonormal basis for uh, the range of A. What does that mean? By definition, that means that they're a maximal orthonormal subset of the range of A. So we have to show that if something's in the range and it's orthogonal to every uh, one of these eigenvectors, then that thing has to be zero. Okay? So the claim if f is in the range of A, and for all k, uh, f inner product uk equals zero, then f is a zero vector. Okay? Okay. So, So this is the claim we want to prove. So suppose we have something in the range. That means we can write it as A times U and uh, F inner product UK equals zero for all K. Okay. Then for all K, uh, if I look at lambda K, u inner product uk, this is equal to um, lambda k is a real number, so I can bring it all the way in, get lambda k uk, and this is equal to uA applied to uk. Now, A is self-adjoint, so I can move this A over here to u, and this is equal to f inner product uk equals zero for all k. So by this uh, maximum principle, which we proved uh, just a minute ago, we conclude that the norm of f, which is equal to the norm of a u, which is equal to the norm of a minus sum from k equals 1 to n of lambda k u UK, um, UK applied to U, right? Because every one of these numbers is zero, so I haven't uh, subtracted off anything, right? This is uh, so I can write this in terms of um, this A sub n apply to you, where a sub n was uh, this thing that, or a sub n is this thing, which um, by the previous, uh, or the proof of the maximization, or the maximum principle, is less than or equal to lambda plus 1, n plus 1 of u, because again, um, remember this thing here is the supremum over all u's of unit length of a sub n applied to u. So uh, lambda n plus 1 is less than or, or, or this quantity here divided by the norm of u, so that u is a unit length, is always less than or equal to this quantity here. But now lambda, so this, I had a fixed thing here, norm of f, and I've shown it's less than or equal to lambda n plus 1 times the norm of u. This is a fixed thing, and the lambda n's are converging to 0. Okay, and thus, I started off with something non-negative, less than or equal to something converging to zero, and therefore that thing had to be zero. Therefore, f is zero. Okay, so um, this proves, one, that these eigenvectors are <clears throat> a maximal orthonormal um, subset of the range of A. 
And for two, we simply note uh, that by one, we have that the range of A closure. This is since the um, eigenvectors are an orthonormal basis for uh, the range of A, the closure is contained in the closure of the spans of the UKs here. This is a finite span. Um, which remember, this is by uh, an assignment exercise. This is equal to K, C, K, U, K, such that Therefore, uh, this implies that is an orthonormal basis for the range of A closure. And this is equal to the range of A orthogonal complement orthogonal complement, um, which is equal to the null space of, or the orthogonal complement of the null space of A star, A star equals A, so we get that. So the UKs, the eigenvectors form an orthogonal, uh, or an orthonormal basis for the orthogonal complement of the null space of A. So once we've chosen an orthonormal basis for uh, null space of A, that's it. H is separable, and the null space of A is a closed subspace of H. Um, null space of A is separable, and we've proven that every separable uh, Hilbert space, or, or um, even just, uh, okay, so this is a closed one, so it's a Hilbert space anyways, but every separable Hilbert space has an orthonormal basis. Therefore, again, so we, uh, since these two, call this Fj, this is an orthonormal basis for the null space of A direct product, null space of A orthogonal complement. That equals H. All right. And just in the nick of time, I'm finished. So next time, um, where do we go from here? We'll see uh, some of this applied um, in a concrete setting of differential equations and also discuss the functional calculus.